Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by BonusRound.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at BonusRound.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, the Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury. Tell Us About Yourself, Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery, and how it illuminates cultural history. And their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. about yourself, would you? Tell us something about you. For any new viewers, won't you tell us again about yourself? We've met before, but let's meet again. Tell us about yourself. What else can you tell us about yourself? Perhaps you'd fill us in again and tell us about yourself. I live in Austin, Texas, and I'm an assistant principal at an elementary school. So, Sarah, I typically start these conversations by asking what role game shows played in the contestant's life before they became a contestant. And I've talked to dozens of people over the couple of years that I've been doing this show, and the answers have varied so greatly. There are some people who look at this as a sort of side job. You know, when they're not making money at their job, they get on a game show and make extra money. Some people absolutely live for this kind of thing. Some people can sort of take it or leave it. And it was just a one-time experience. How important were game shows to you growing up? Um, 
I, growing up, actually, I don't think they were. It wasn't until I think college that I got really into like Jeopardy um, and doing local trivia. And I think it was in part because I have older brothers and they would take me to like bar trivia when I came of age. Um, we would do, I'm sure it's kind of everywhere, geeks who drink. Um, we mainly just trivia bars, to be honest. Um, and yeah, no, I don't think I really watch too many actual game shows on TV other than Jeopardy. Um, maybe like The Price is Right and um, a few others as I was younger, but I didn't really have cable, so I didn't really, um, I didn't get to watch a lot of TV. Sure, and Jeopardy, growing up especially, is one of those shows that even if you don't like game shows per se, you like Jeopardy because this sort of transcends that idea of a game show. I mean, it, it's a it's a family activity, I feel like. I mean, that's how I watched it. I watched it with my dad every day at uh, at seven o'clock and we'd pray for an art category because my dad was an artist. And so he was always looking forward to that. Oh. So it was something like that, like the family sort of enjoyed. It wasn't strictly, you know, I mean, it's a game show, but I think it filled so many more roles than a, a, a regular game show would. And I think that's why the bar trivia was was it for me because it was me and my brothers, right? I got to hang out with my brothers and not so much the TV because they're all 10 years older than me and nine years older than me. So by the time, you know, I was in middle school, they were already out of the house in college. Um, so I think it became more of a an, an older adult thing that I that I did. What ages were you involved in the sort of pub trivia thing like how old were you when you when that activity was like at its peak for you oh man <laughs> probably actually not till the most recent um maybe like in my late 20s early 30s and so being somebody who could at least appreciate what jeopardy sort of brought to the table in terms of knowledge in terms of trivia um how important was uh, knowledge and learning and trivia and things like that to you, like when you were in school, was that something that sort of manifested itself outside oh, of that area? Yeah, I, I'm a person that likes to know little tidbits. You know, when I was growing up, again, like I didn't really have cable, but back in the day, like the the big book was like the Guinness Book of Records and, and just like learning random facts about the Guinness Book of Records or, um, you know, just very non-fiction kids books that had you know animal facts or you know solar system facts and and things that I was always just really interested in of course you know I followed into education because I really was like I studied philosophy and English literature and if I could I would have done like linguistics and a lot more I'm the type of person that always wants more knowledge and can gather the fact that I'm never going to attain all of it but um the more the better well, that's part of the fun, I think, of, of of learning is that you'll never know it all. Like it's like a, it's a never ending quest. Yeah, it's kind of a a double edged sword because I'm always like, I really want to learn more, but do what? It, what is it going to gain me? And so that's why I was like really excited that like this opportunity came to me because I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe I can get a show off a little bit. <laughs> right, right, right. And you know. Uh, Growing up, I never really had more than basic cable for the vast majority of my childhood. And so I grew up watching a lot of the same type of shows that you're describing. And The Simpsons was a show that definitely appealed to me because it was on five times a day and it was just unlike anything else on TV at the time. How did The Simpsons enter your life? In the same way, no cable. And yet here's this cartoon show that's like in prime time that I could finally get to watch that like I'm not busy at school or after school activities and and really other than TGIF there really wasn't anything else um so it was I, I love the Simpsons and again that's it's it's more of a it was a family act activity it was something that I got to watch with my brothers um and then again you know watch again with them as older when I became older like every time we do Thanksgiving Christmases or any time that we have holidays where we get together we spend the majority of our time just watching the Simpsons and quoting it um we we that is our biggest trivia thing that we try to find if we try to find a Simpsons trivia um we will go out of our way to make sure that it happens um you know my brothers don't live in the same city as me anymore but they will come here to do a simpsons trivia or i will go there to do a simpsons trivia um there's just not that many 
no, that's true. I wish there were more. <laughs> I, I am I am guilty of being the kind of person that uh, consists mainly of uh, processed meat and Simpsons quotes. <laughs> that's really the majority of my existence. <laughs> and I, wait, whether whether it's socially appropriate, whether it's not socially appropriate, if something happens that reminds me of a quote, it will come out and just we and we will proceed with life as normal. But I I um yeah I read I don't remember if it was Springfield Confidential or it was another book about The Simpsons and 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 they talked in a chapter about how uh, Simpsons quotes are almost like a language unto their own. And when you find somebody who uh, can understand your references to The Simpsons, it's like finding somebody who speaks like an archaic language. And all of a sudden, you communicate on a different level with that person. I wonder how many experiences you've had like that, where you run into somebody who suddenly understands that part of you, and it's like easier to communicate with them. Yes, and I had to repress it a lot of the times because other than my brothers, I really don't know anybody that, that likes the Simpsons. It's very niche in the sense where like when you find your, pe- your people, you find your people. But like my partner right now um, watched the Simpsons, but not to the degree where he was able to quote it. And so I got him into it. Um, all my friends are, are are kind of younger than me and they weren't into the, you know, the Simpsons. Um my, me and my brothers have started this new thing where it's not even quotes. It's like, we'll we'll play an episode and we challenge ourselves to see within the first like 10 seconds of the episode if we can like, you know, retell what the A plot is or the B plot is of the, of the, of the, of the show. Um, and it's kind of like a new challenge that we're doing. Um, but you know what? I've never been the type to to just do quotes out in the public because I've just had to repress a lot because no one gets it (laughs) right and i wonder if being an educational professional you have to maintain a sort of level of decorum that maybe precludes you from quoting the simpsons all day yeah i can't i can't just you know purple purple monkey dishwasher is what i always want to say when i like enter a room and i'm like okay i can't do that (laughs) (laughs) you know what's funny i'm a hotel manager and we have a bar on site and i clocked in one day this is a couple years ago and, uh, th- and there was a new beer on tap called Purple Monkey Dishwasher. <laughs> and I loved it. And nobody knew why I loved it. And nobody understood it. But I it was just it was just a, it was a it was a it was a personal bit of joy for me that I understood right. what it meant and nobody else did. <laughs> I was right next to Skittle Brow or something. I, you know, I just I can't like I can't do these things because I, it will go over people's heads. And I've That's learned right. <laughs> that like, it's not it's not worth to explain. Needs um, more dog. <laughs> red tick beer yeah that's um, right <laughs> uh doof <laughs> yeah doof. i love it um you know what's funny i feel like and i don't know if this holds water or not but i feel like the simpsons as a cartoon as a comedy appeals to people who like to learn. It appeals to smart people. It's definitely not, um, you know, as popular as it is and as popular as it's been, it's definitely, I think, made for a bit of a higher brow audience. And so it takes a certain yeah, level of, of understanding, I think, to appreciate it um, in its entirety. I mean, you have to be somebody who likes learning and enjoys being smart and is proud of being smart to enjoy The Simpsons to that degree. And I think that's 100% true. I was never really able to get into other cartoons that like at the time people were like, well, if you like the Simpsons, don't you love South Park or and not really know, um, yeah. you know, Futurama, of course, was also Matt Groening. So, of course, I, I, I enjoyed Futurama, but nothing really was up to par to the Simpsons. And I think it is because, you know, they had these Harvard graduates, you know, writing a, a a show and it was and it's hilarious and there's things that still go above my head because I'm like I you know I was alive in the 90s but I wasn't really cognizant of like a lot of these um weird references I'm like Harry Kissinger who is that I don't know <laughs> right um, yeah they're really giving it to that Steve Radu <laughs> guy he must work there yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was, there was one it was uh it was the episode where they go to Japan and they run into Woody Allen filming a commercial for oh yeah uh, f- for Kurosawa rice cakes, and he said, "This is so humiliating. What did I do to deserve <laughs> this?" Oh, right. 
<laughs> oh yeah exactly and like you know, that like years <laughs> later i get it but like when you're young and i love that kind of thing and he i feel like cartoons of, of that particular era i don't know exactly how old you are but I'll, I'll assume we're more or less in the same sort of bracket but i grew up like in the era of nick tunes like rock was modern life and and, mm-hmm. and and rugrats and all these shows that had adult humor kind of baked into it were like you could only understand it if you were of that age and really what it does is cre- it creates this beautiful sort of like Easter egg as you get older and, re- and like rewatch some of this stuff. And it's almost like a different, you know, you're like watching it through a different dimension. Like there's a whole other uh, world of comedy kind of just baked into the center of it that you don't get to appreciate until you're older. Yeah, I think there was a meme going around about Rugrats and like about the parents and how like now you identify with the parents of like these shows when we were younger, you're like, oh, I'm just a child. And now you're like, oh, these poor parents. Oh, 100 um, percent. Right, right, right. <laughs> now I don't have kids, but I'm like, I'm, just, I, you know, I'm, I'm in education, so I'm like tired all the time. <laughs> so Yeah, you uh, get it. And, and they were hitting on stuff like that back before we even knew that that was going to be a thing in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like the Simpsons for right now, how I don't even know how to explain it, but like I think if I didn't have the Simpsons, I wouldn't be yeah, I wouldn't try to learn as much as I as I have. I think mainly because I'm like looking up these old references to these things like Spirit Wagyu, right? Um I'm always constantly trying to um just be the person that kind of knows a little bit of everything. Um, and I would say probably, I, I would agree that like, that is a good part of the Simpsons kind of, um, atmosphere. Yeah, for sure. Well, because I think that, and, and, and not to dwell on this part of it for too long, cause I can talk about the Simpsons forever, but I think that there's almost a sort of aspirational quality to it because I think that everybody wants to be smart and funny. And there aren't many other shows on TV that make such a good you know, they do such a good job of proudly being smart and funny at the same time. There's like that intersection. I think Conan said it once too in an interview. He was talking about the ending of his talk show and he said like, there is like a bit of magic that resides at the intersection of smart and stupid. For like, <laughs> you can be silly and it could also be highbrow. It could be smart. It can be, uh, you know, intelligent. And I think that uh, whether they realized it or not, I think that The Simpsons inspired many generations of aspiring writers, aspiring content producers, aspiring comedians. Um, you know, m- inspired them, and 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 again, just sort of like brought home that idea that like it, it's cool to be smart and funny. Yeah, yeah. You know. Anyway. Um, let's talk about how the opportunity to appear on the floor sort of materialized for you. Um, how did you hear about the opportunity and what made you want to follow through on that process? So as I've become more busy with work, obviously, I actually just recently got promoted to assistant principal. I don't really go to trivia nights as much, but I listen to this trivia podcast, um, it's called trivia time and just like as i'm on my way to work when i'm getting groceries i listen to this you know this podcast and one day i was coming out of yoga and i turn it on and it's like hey if you're interested in this trivia game show like go to this website um and so i'm like sweating i'm out of like yoga and i'm like what the heck i'm gonna sit in my car and i'm just gonna go check this out um, so I, ch- I checked it out and it was just like a Google form. It was like the most, like, just like plain, like, what's your name? Um, you know, wh- describe yourself. Why do you like trivia? Um, and then it had this part where it says like, make a two minute clip. And in my head, I'm like, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's nothing's going to come of this. What the hell? I'm just going to make a video clip in my car right now. Um, and so I'm like sweating and my clip literally just says, I'm, uh, I love trivia, so why not me? And that was it. (laughs) So So real quick, what about this made you want to say yes to that? Because I think that a lot of people would be incredibly nervous at the possibility of putting the, of, of putting themselves out there that way. And this is the first time you're doing a thing like this, right? Well, I feel like I'm uh, the type of person that like, once I've hit a certain 
I love change or, you know, I, I, I am a little bit more outgoing and brave, uh, you know, and I think there's part of me that misses that because I've kind of become more introverted when I used to be so extroverted when I was younger. Um, I have just like sold all my things and moved to Japan or I've done these things where I'm just like, I'm just going to do it because why not, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think this was kind of a reclaiming of that. Like, I just need to just do it. Why not? I'm not happy with my work at, at the moment. I was, I was still working at my old job and I wasn't happy. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm in between jobs right now. Let me just do this thing. Why not? And was there anything in your life previously that might have foreshadowed an opportunity to be on TV? Did you have any interest in performing or acting or being on stage or public speaking? Anything of that nature that might have uh, sort, sort of foreshadowed that? No, the opposite, the opposite. I mean, when I was younger, I was in theater. Um, and like I said, I used to be, I think, I used to be this really outgoing person. And I think just as as I've gotten older and more cranky and been educated for so long, I've really, you know, become introverted. And I've never been even close to anything on TV or, and in my mind, I don't know why I didn't really see the connection of it being like this big TV thing. I was like, maybe it's just like, a competition or I don't know. Um, it didn't really hit me. And I guess in that moment that it would be like TV, I knew it, it could be, but um, it was so, it was vague enough that I was like, you know, it's not going to be anything huge. Yeah. Just something you could throw your hat in the ring for and then kind of proceed as normal until you hear back from it or not. Yes. And so you make the video. How long did it take for the producers of The Floor to get back to you after you submitted that initial audition video? I think about two, three weeks. And at that time, I was like, oh, yeah, I already forgot about this thing because like, I didn't even tell anybody. I didn't think it was going to. I A part of me was like, I just filled it out for fun just to be silly in my own head, to give myself a little fun that day. Nothing was going to come out of it. Um, but then a casting agent, um, not so much the producers, but I think casting reached out to me um, and said, hey, we watched your your video and we saw your application and we would like to, you know, interview you. Um, and yeah, that was two, three weeks after. Uh, excited to hear from them, I can imagine. It was. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> like, I forgot. Um, it was. I was really like nervous uh, as I am now. I'm not a, I. I'm not really good at public speaking or speaking on the spot. Um, oh, you're doing a great job so far. <laughs> this is going This is going wonderfully. It's exactly okay. the way I want it to go. No, this is fantastic. I'm um, perfect. I feel like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Sarah, but I feel like 21st century educators, like people who are in that particular field, especially within the past few years, um, have an advantage when it comes to communicating via Zoom because... I know that a lot of these a lot of these interviews these days happen through Zoom or happen via phone. And I have had the pleasure of doing a few of these shows. And most of the time, um, they're auditions in person. They're in-person interviews. They're in-person tests. And that's where I feel like I thrive. I, I think I suck at communicating through Zoom on video. I, I can do audio like we're doing right now just fine because this is like a phone call. But when it comes to identifying the sort of social cues that you pick up on in person when you're talking to somebody, mm -hmm. when it comes to stepping over somebody else's words or those awkward sort of like, oh, 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 no, after you, like those things, I hate that. And they zap my confidence when it comes to situations like that. Um, how are you when it comes to communicating through Zoom and how do you feel you did in this particular uh, interaction? You know, I think I am pretty okay when it's one-to-one. -one. I, I think like, you know, I'm always... I don't even mind public speaking when it's something I know I know, right? Like I can, you know, part of my job right now is to, you know, uh, train and do learning and developments and professional developments and going in front of a group of people and, you know, telling them. But when it's something I'm confident in, when it's something I know I know, um, I can do it easy. But when it's like these kind of conversations where we're like, I don't know what's coming up next, <laughs> you know, um, I am a little bit more nervous and reserved and, um, I do find it easier to do Zoom than in person because I 
I, I think like every kid our age, I do have like slight ADD. So it is very easy for me to like get distracted or, um, you know, overthink, like, am I looking in this person's eyes long enough? Am I looking into these person's eyes too long? You know? And right. So- <laughs> right. Exactly. I, I, over, I overthink things like that. And especially when it comes to game show interviews, like they always say, you know, we want to see your energy, be energetic, be, you know, you know, this is for TV. So you have to, you have to like amp yourself up and you have to be yourself kind of turned up to 11. And I can do that just fine uh, in person when I'm there and I'm, there's, there's the, there's real life energy to sort of feed off of, but it's hard for me to uh, manifest that energy for myself when I know it's just me in my pajamas at my desk in front of a computer. You know, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I always say, like, if you're really into trivia, you're going to be a little awkward. Like, it's just how it is. <laughs> like, that, I mean, know. that's true. That's true. We don't, we don't enjoy trivia because everything is all right up there. <laughs> yeah, like, we're, we're there's, yeah, we're, there's going to be a little bit of social awkwardness or... Um, so I think, like, the, the chance of the interview was actually really neat. Like, he was a really... I, you know, and I feel so bad because I think I was just so in awe of the situation and I'm not, I guess I'm not a good person, but I don't remember people's names really well, but everybody I talked to on the show is like, oh, I love talking to so-and-so and so-and-so at the beginning. And I'm like, oh, I didn't do a good job of remembering their names. Um, Cause again, I was just more in shock than in anything throughout this entire process. Um Oh, sure. And I think they understand that as well, because they're, I, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't talked to anyone else who's been on this particular show. Yet. I've gotten a couple emails from people who have been on the show that that uh, that want to talk to me about it. But um, it seems like they picked a lot of people who've never been on shows before. There are some shows who look for uh, brand new contestants. Some other yeah. shows will look for people that have been on other things in the past just to sort of guarantee that they're getting people that, you know, that know how the machine works. Yeah, um, but I guarantee you that those people understand that you're just I mean, it, it's hard not to be in all right. I mean, let alone yeah. the audition process. But I mean, you make it on the show, which is why you're talking to me now. And like once you get <laughs> there, I mean, you see the set, you have this idea of the money that's at stake and what you're, you know, the game that you're playing. And it's, it's this massive thing on the floor. And Rob Lowe is there for some reason. I mean, there's a lot to take in. <laughs> It was, I was running on adrenaline. Yeah, I was running on adrenaline. But um, even in the casting calls, there was this element of, is this real? Like, is this a scam? (laughs) Oh, yeah. You know, the entire time I was like Googling every name at the time, I like would find out their names and Google it and make sure that they were real casting people because I was like, this is it. Like, they're going to ask me for money and I'm going to feel like a dumbass for (laughs) wasting so much time doing this thing because it wasn't one casting call. It was several casting calls. Um, The first one was very much like um, doing a slight trivia quiz, um, all pictures. Um, He was really nice kind of walking me through uh, what the show would kind of be like but not giving away too much. Um, And then the proceeding and then I think there was two more casting calls where it was one where it was just like okay now we're gonna make a video for the producers to see so we need you to have like a niche of like what are you gonna do and originally it was the Simpsons I was like I want to do the Simpsons I I have a Simpsons tattoo like I'm in love with the Simpsons I can quote it I can there's seasons one through ten right like I'm like but I will sure. watch the rest if I have to and you know I have but if you have to <laughs> let's not go crazy to. but if it gets to that point begrudgingly I guess I could watch season 11 I whatever mean, I, no I like 11 and 12 actually I don't know why I see people say 10 because I actually really go up to 13 um, yeah my sweet spot is 3 through 13 those like those are the episodes yeah. I, I have I have saved on my um I, I I have like a like a like a thing I play on my Game Boy games on and it plays videos like that's what I have saved on my thing that's like yeah. my that's my I sweet mean, spot. I like one and two they're 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 not as funny but they're they're great and um so I go up to thirteen but I, I begrudgingly watch the rest I sometimes do like a randomizer on Frinkiac I just randomize there and then I'm like okay you tell me what episode to watch um just leave it up to the all id aller <laughs> yeah all id <laughs> i get it <laughs> i get jokes that's right <laughs> <laughs> all right so you go through the audition process on zoom and, and thank you for mentioning this by the way and i'll say this for anyone who's listening who ever has any doubt never pay for an audition 
a game show audition will never ask you for money. They'll never ask you to pay for anything. There's never an application fee. If you ever get asked for money by anyone who says they're from any sort of game show and wanting to just don't, 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 don't. They'll never ask for it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, me, I'm like, when, when is the, when is the shoe going to drop? Right. Like when, it, when, when is something bad going to happen? Cause I was just like, this is just too easy. Um, they did eventually tell me no to the Simpsons. They were like, no, it's too niche. You, too many people want to do the Simpsons. And I was like, really? Okay. Um, so they told me no. And interesting still- considering it's a Fox show. It, 100%. And we'll go into that <laughs> in a little yeah, bit. Sure. How it came out, but, um, yeah, they said no. And so I was like, okay, well, what else? I'm also a big horror buff. Um, so I was like, and, and you know, another niche market. I was like Stephen King books. Like I know all the Stephen King movies and Stephen King books. And um, I have a vast collection um, and just horror movies in general. So then we went the horror movie route. Um, he tried to, you know, he was like, well, I know you, you were, you know, at the time I was a, a teacher. And so he's like, you know, what have you taught? And I was like, well, I taught social studies and ELA and he's like well we, have you thought about Texas history and I was like no I don't want to do that <laughs> so right. it was kind of like a, like a pitch meeting of like di- pitching different ideas and finally we settled on Simpsons and horror movies um and so he did a little bit of the Simpsons but mainly just stuck to horror movies and so that's what I actually originally pitched okay and 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 the subject of horror movies is something that you like, but I don't imagine you felt the same level of confidence in that skill set as you did in your in your Simpsons knowledge. Yeah, I think I would I would be way more. I mean, at least with the Simpsons, it's kind of you know I can probably say I've probably seen almost every episode. Can I say I've seen every horror movie? No, <laughs> you know, right? Right, um, right, right. And now, but, as you go to the studio, like in, in that time between the audition and the time you find out you're going to be on the show and 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 you get to the show you know for sure what your category is in that period of time right no we don't and so that was oh. the, the thing that really messed with a lot of us is that i we didn't um we didn't know until the night before wow yeah and so, so you didn't even have any time i mean i, I was going to ask how you prepare um in terms of the knowing worst. the Simpsons, but like I've seen every episode at least like 500 times. Like if I yeah. was in a position where somebody was going to quiz me on the seasons of the Simpsons that I know, I don't know how much more preparation I could do that would, you know, eventually just push out other information. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Remember when you took that wine making course and you forgot yeah, how to drive? I forgot to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that. <laughs> You know what I mean, though? Like, I don't know what I would do to prepare for that. Like, what did you do, if anything? Well, and that's the thing. Like, I, we, okay, so after the whole casting thing, I was, like, sure, like, it was going to be something horror related. Eventually, they gave us a list of possible topics. And it was, like, a list of maybe, uh, you know, at first it was, like, a list of, like, 60 to 80 topics. Um. And and it was like TV shows and um, Seinfeld was on there and it wasn't even on the show. Like it was like a list of things, um, just like a bunch of topics. And, you know, I'm trying to recall if The Simpsons were on there. I don't even know if The Simpsons were on there yet, but it was like Seinfeld and like uh, vegetables and fruits and like athletes and stuff and football teams and soccer teams, things that like didn't even end up actually on the show um but they gave us a list of possible topics uh, about 60 or 80 and i really didn't know how to study for this i was like <laughs> looking looking back like i did all the wrong things i was <laughs> i i i used this random generate uh like random it's like a generator of like numbers and i just basically listed all of these categories by number i put a number next to them and did a random number generator and anytime it landed on that i would just study that for the day um and it wasn't particularly helpful but it wasn't a bad idea at the time um 
Right, I but it gets say, you prepared to like hear yeah. anything. You know, it, it kind of hedges your bets in that way. One hundred percent. And the one clue that I got was that it was a visual test. Like it, it was all going to be visual. Like we knew it was going to be visual. They told us that from the get go that um, that they had already done this show um, overseas and like I can't remember if it was like a, a, a Swedish show. Um, I remember trying to Google it and it was like nowhere to be found. Um, and the only thing they told us was it's going to be visual, like it's going to be pictures. So everything that I was looking up, I would be like making sure to look up pictures of it. Um, so like NFL team mascots and NFL team you know, logos, um, fast food logos. So I was just looking up, studying anything I could visually. And so we should probably, before we go any further, explain a little bit about how this game works. Explain to the folks at home how the floor is played. So it is a set of 81, you know, floor squares, and you are an expert, or they they want to convey that you are an expert in a category, a trivia category, and you own a piece of this big board, this big game board, 81 squares, you own a, a square of it. You go head to head with someone, um, you know, on their expertise or on your expertise, depending on whether you were randomized. If you were randomized, you go head to head against someone else. If you are already up there, you can continue playing and you go head to head on someone else's category as well. Um, there's rarely, I think, I don't think there's a time where you get to do your own category unless somebody chooses you, you know? Hmm. Um, Seems like a flaw, but continue. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, it, it, it definitely. You know, there are definitely. I think kinks that could work out, or things that like it was the first time they've. I'm sure they've done this, and it, it was very exciting. But I was like, wow, like you're really at a disadvantage <laughs> if you are randomized only because you don't get to do your category, and you have to go first. So theoretically, if you're if you guys are working off the same time and you're exactly doing the same pace you have less time because you go first right um, right 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 yeah you're kind of thrown to the lions i guess if you if you get yeah. if you get there. yeah so it it would that was the most anxious part of this entire thing is like no one wanted to get randomized <laughs> sure and you know i remember from seeing the promos for the show before it eventually aired uh the enduring vision of the show was that massive floor it looked like you know like you said it was 81 people it looked like a little country and the, and eventually the idea i think was that as players get eliminated or players get you know conquered their part of the floor gets swallowed up by another player and eventually you know just makes this big sort of mishmash pattern um but but the sight of the set it just looked enormous what was your what did it feel like walking into that and 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 seeing it for the first time as as somebody who wasn't really initiated into this whole like world of game shows and TV and stuff? Like, what was it like seeing all that in person? It was extremely overwhelming. I am easily overstimulated by lights and sounds, and I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> this is a lot." There was also a full audience, right? And so there's a lot of people. There's so many cameras and things in the ceiling, and. Um, the entire time there's like a hair and makeup crew as well um a constantly like fixing you up which felt really fancy i felt really fancy i'm not gonna lie uh oh yeah <laughs> oh for sure that's to me that's like one of the most fun parts like before the show even begins like there's that part where there's somebody explaining what's going to happen and then there's another person like doing like the pancake makeup thing and then like you're signing stuff and yeah you feel like you feel like a real star for like a minute yeah, it was it was really it was overwhelming in a good way. Um, I was nervous. Like, if you watch the video, I'm like doing this like weird like hand me movement that I don't even realize I'm doing until I watch myself on TV. I was like, wow, I'm really nervous, huh? Um, and it's just like so many lights. Um, I was like, they told us that these were LED screens on the floor. And I was like, oh, knowing me, I'm going to break it. Like, let me just be as careful as possible standing <laughs> here. Um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was really overwhelming in, in, in some sense, a good way, in some sense, a very like adrenaline inducing um, 
kind of high, you know, you were, we're also jet lagged and really tired. And so, um, lack of sleep, uh, was the biggest, one of the biggest things that like, were that happening to all of us? Cause we were all so nervous, right? Oh yeah, so sure. None sure, of us were sleeping. Sure. Right. Yeah. And you know, one of the, um, one of the things people seem to notice when they see a TV set for the first time is how small it is in person compared to what it might look like on TV. Now, this is a different kind of thing because you've never seen the show before. So there's no like mm -hmm. frame of reference. But like I remember when I went to The Price is Right in 2007, uh, it was so surreal because you walk in and it's everything, everything that you've seen your whole life is there. But it's mm -hmm. so small and it's so beat up it's like it looks like a little traveling Aww. carnival show <laughs> and like by the time you leave it's like it ha everything happens so quickly that like by the time you leave it's like what what the fuck just happened like what just yeah. happened it's so it's like it, it it's like the it's like the suspension of disbelief doesn't happen in time for you to like process it you know yeah. so i left there feeling like it was a total dream and i didn't really like the images didn't really gel for me until I saw myself on TV a couple of weeks later. But like, it's just so surreal sometimes to walk into a set and, and, and just see how, how small everything is. TV makes everything look so huge. And I think it does a really good job of making this, of this show, of making this show look really big as well. I, and I would say this might be the one case where it is like truly big. It was a truly big set. Like, I mean, we had to fit 81 people right on these squares and these squares were massive. Um, I like, I don't know if this is a case where like, I didn't even get to know like half the people there until after, because like when you were on the other side of the floor, you were like foreign to me because <laughs> you were so far away. Um, and then even in like, when we were eating lunches and going back to, I guess, like whatever, I don't, is it called a green room? I don't know. Right, uh, right. Like the, the room away from the set, um, there were so many people, there's 81 of us you know, and, and it, it was massive. It felt massive and it really truly was. I didn't even get to meet even like, I met like 20 out of those 81 people, you know? Yeah. I never really thought of that dynamic that you're sort of stationed on your section of the floor and you really probably get to know the people around you, but there's a whole yeah. other world on the other side of the floor that you never really get to meet. I never <laughs> thought of that. That's a, that's a fascinating dynamic actually. Yeah. And so, and then that's like the scary part, right? It's like you hear whispers of like, oh, that person really wants to go after you because they love the Simpsons. And I was like, oh shit, you know, like, right. who are, they? are they really good at the Simpsons? Should I start studying their category? You know, like, wow. You, things so like there's that, that like, like in your head. <laughs> yeah. There's like that social dynamic where you're hearing gossip about the other side of the floor. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it's very, I think like what I hear, because, you know, there were people that were on different game shows at that show, um, which gave me like massive imposter syndrome. I'm like, I'm, I'm a normie. <laughs> like, I'm, just like, sure. I'm just a normal person. What do you mean you've been on other shows before? Right, right, right. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of potential for like, um, for like the psychological aspect of the game to come into play. There's a yeah. lot, of, it seems like there's a lot of potential to like psych other people out and- 100%. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was what was definitely happening. And, you know, as I got to know the people around me, I was like, oh, they're very smart. You know, they, they really do. But I was so confident because I knew I could, I could probably, to this day, I will say that I, I truly feel like I could outmatch any of them on The Simpsons, right? Um, but, you know, if you, you know, spoiler, <laughs> if you saw, that's not what happened. But <laughs> That's all right. Anybody listening is listening because they saw the show. Already. <laughs> this is um, this is a, this is a total spoiler zone. But, you know, like in my mind, there was an element of like imposter syndrome and an element of confidence. Right. Like I was kind of in between of like, I know I know this, you know, I know I know this. Um, but then you know, everything else, I was like, oh, you know, the person behind me, really smart guy, his name is Gene, um, you know, as the, as the duels were playing, would like silently really whisper the answers. And I was like, he knows all of these answers. He's really smart, <laughs> you know? Um, Wait a second, I, Gene? Yes, Gene, you know Gene? Gene emailed me. 
Oh, okay. He emailed me. He wants he wants to be on the show too. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get back to you. Cool. Okay. He's so he's so funny. I you know I could have bet my last dollar that he was gonna win it all because he's so funny. He's so smart. Right behind me would whisper all these things, and I just every day I got more and more intimidated by the people I was around. Um, that's a and, lot. I mean, I mean, that's a lot of big feelings to maintain throughout oh, an experience <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah. And like I don't envy the role of the contestant coordinators who are managing all of these feelings times 81. I mean, they're dealing with almost 100 people that are probably to varying degrees feeling what you're describing, Sarah, like this, like the imposter syndrome and like, do I do I belong here? Like, am I going to do well? Am I going to embarrass myself? Which is one of the core sort of fears, I think, of, of a lot of game show contestants. Like, am I going to be embarrassed on TV? Um Looking back at the experience, do you feel like the people in charge of you, for for lack of a better phrase on the show, the contestant coordinators, do you think that they did a good job of sort of reining in those emotions for you? Like, did you feel tended to in that way? I, you know, I have I have big feelings about this. And, you know, looking back, I, I've kind of let a lot of those go. But, you know, me and a group of people were really like, this was PTSD and trauma inducing in a, in a sense, because it was really big feelings. And some of our needs weren't really heard. Um, and I don't think it was a lack of trying. It's I think it's a lack of like, there are 81 people, you know what I mean, to, um, you know, the biggest thing that became the biggest point of, of, uh, of our frustration was going to the restroom. You know, we were in a place with like four porta potties, maybe like eight tops. I can't remember four to eight porta potties and 81 contestants plus the whole um, audience that try to go to the restroom at the same time. You know? Oh, that's a nightmare. Um, oh, so there was an audience <laughs> there. There was like a live audience. Yeah, there was a live audience. And so it was like all of these little points where we did have frustrations and we did or we're like we're hungry and tired and i just need some water right now or but we're filming and there's 81 of us and we all have different needs at different times um and it was long days of filming like we were there from maybe like 7 8 a.m till 10 p.m you know um and i didn't anticipate that i didn't anticipate like the frustrations we would have on just like being there and how like our anxiety would take over or all of these big feelings would would i really didn't anticipate i would have like these huge feelings i, I was like oh but i'll be nervous that i'm gonna make a fool of myself on tv but it just like it spiraled into like again i think all of us were also um were jet lag, lack of sleep, and and just like that played into it. So I don't, you know, I don't think there was anything much else they could have done after the first day where we complained about the restroom. They were a little bit better about giving giving us more restroom breaks. Um, but I don't know. Could I say that I felt like my needs were truly met? No, I don't think so. We had the psychologist that they. They, they did a Zoom with us before we we show, like we went and on the show and kind of described that kind of imposter feeling or like the nervousness or, but it felt more into like tick a box, you know, rather than actually like doing anything because I never saw that guy again, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm, say, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of turning it over in my head and I'm, I'm trying to reason how that would be a... A, like an emotionally productive experience for somebody who's entering into that for the first time. I mean, I think about like I've talked to people who have been on Wheel of Fortune and Wheel of Fortune in the yeah. in the scope of shows that I've discussed with people on 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 this particular podcast. Wheel of Fortune always comes up as an example of a show where the people in charge of the contestants make the contestants feel like the stars of the show for that oh, episode, wow. for that half hour, however long it takes to to film an episode of Wheel of Fortune. That like they feel like they are at home with people that have their best interests in mind. And like you said, it's probably not for lack of trying, but it's very difficult. Well, they were to... really nice. Everybody yeah, was I'm nice. sure they were. But like, and I imagine it's, it's like very nice. Right. Like it's it's probably difficult to maintain that atmosphere for so many people. And also, 
you know, the idea that this is the first season of a brand new show. So everybody working on the show is really sort of learning along with the contestants. I mean, this isn't mm -hmm. a thing that they've been through a million times. They're all sort of, you know, going on this adventure together. So I'm sure they've learned a lot. I hope they've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work, especially from the from the interpersonal standpoint, which you really need to you need to have that down pat in order for that to come across on the show. Yeah. And, you know, I, it's also business, right? Like I get just reminding myself, is this what show business is, baby? Like, this is it. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> and they, I will say like the, there were, a, you know, some people that were really, really nice. Um, I probably didn't have that many, you know, I, I feel like I had a producer, um, who was super attentive at, like at the beginning, like she would text me like, what are you going to wear, you know, for the show and was really sweet. And actually like we communicated back and forth. And once the show started, like, of course she had to go do her own thing, but I feel like prior to the show, I definitely felt that way. And then like on the show, not quite, not so much. And I think it was like the bigger executive producers that I only saw him once. He said this thing and probably, you know, I hope this doesn't mean I won't ever get casted on another show again because I'm I'm open to it. But he said this thing that I I'm like, yeah, that's that's definitely probably how they see us. Um it, it was a joke. He was on stage and he's like, I don't care where you stand, you're all sheep to me, right? And he said it lightly as a joke. It was a joke. But in my mind, I was like, Oh, that's such a Freudian slip. Like, you really don't see us as anything but sheep. <laughs> like, mm. you know. Mm. That's um, really interesting. I mean, all jokes to a certain degree have a little little kernel of truth in the middle. Yeah, 100%. And, and yeah. there's 81 of us. Like, well, how can you? You know, like I said, it, it is a different type of game show where it's like, there's so many of us. Oh, we're, yeah. A bunch of us are going to be out on the first day, you know? <laughs> like, Right. Yeah, and there is that sort of... I, Maybe mean spirited is a is a is a is a is a heavy handed way of saying it, but there is that idea that people are getting kicked off the show, people are leaving, people are walking away with nothing. There's that whole, yeah. you know, there's a sort of core humiliation in that aspect mm -hmm. of the game. That idea that you know, you know, you lose, get off my property. Yeah, like, and they were not subtle about it. They like booked our flights, and they're like, bye. They <laughs> 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 had your tickets waiting at the door. Yeah, they were like, see ya. That's amazing. Uh, yep. So that's a part that I didn't get early on. Did they fly you out to Ireland to do the show, like on their dime? Yeah, they did. So like, again, back to like the 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 part of the casting, they were like, it's filmed in Ireland. We need you to have a passport and it needs to be within the six month range. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is where they're going to ask me for money <laughs> or, or they're going to sex traffic me. And I'm like, I'm too old. No one wants to sex traffic me. Please don't. Like, <laughs> I just wanted to answer <laughs> Simpsons questions. <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. Um, and but no, I, you know, and I was very wary because I needed to give them my passport like uh, in order for them to book the ticket. Um, and event, I mean, it worked out fine <laughs> yeah in, sure in ireland right um there's a lot of trust in this process and i think that's trust. <laughs> yeah it's happening more and more these days that um shows are filming in other countries like uh i talked to somebody who was on a show called lingo on cbs and that filmed in i think it was ireland or somewhere in the uk um name that tune on fox right now filmed i think in australia um so you need a passport for a lot of these things and and like you said, I'm sure people who aren't used to the whole contestant audition application thing um, have a lot of questions. What do you mean you need my social security number? What do you mean I need to send you my passport? Like there's a lot of trust that yeah. has to fall into place very quickly in order for these things to happen these days. Yeah. And I had, to, I mean, like I said, I just kept Googling all the people I would run it, me and look up their LinkedIn's and their credentials. And Good. Trying to make sure um, that they were real, um, you know, and they would send me, you know, paperwork and NDAs to sign from like their company before all of this as well. And so I was like, OK, this is starting to feel more real as I'm getting more paperwork and as I'm getting all these things. Um, and so that, you know, kind of helped me be a little bit more trusting enough to give them my passport. And, you know, there was also an element of like, is <laughs> I had just finished watching. Have you seen Jury Duty? 
no, I haven't. I've heard about it, but I haven't watched it yet. Well, essentially in Jury Duty, it's about this one guy who's very normal and everybody else is an actor and um, they just kind of make his life very awkward and, you know, put in these like manufactured moments into uh, Jury Duty, you know, for television. But this guy doesn't know he's in television. And so there was an element of also like, am I being like pranked right now? <laughs> is this like, am I going to end up like being on like a weird trivia Jury Duty where like, I don't know, <laughs> like what? I had no idea what this was going to be like, you know, and so every scenario went through my mind. I was like, I'm going to end up losing a kidney or it's going to be a jury duty or I'm really going to do trivia and I'm going to make a fool out of myself. Right. Um, but it, it, it was a very interesting thing because you really don't go. You don't have a lot to go off of. They can't really tell you all aspects of the show. Um, they didn't even have like it might be this much prize money. It might be this, you know. Um, right. They, yeah. They don't even have that part hammered out. Sure. Yeah. And they didn't tell us who the host was. They didn't. Then. Yeah. So we were all kind of left wondering, like, how real is this? It feels very because everything wasn't hammered out and wasn't shared with us. It was like, is this is this just because it's being private and they'll tell us or because they haven't even figured it out for themselves. Right. 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 I might I might leave this in and I might not, but I did a show about a decade ago called The Chase on Game Show Network. And it's on ABC now, but when it originally came to America, they did a few seasons on Game Show Network. And I was on season and I think I was I was either the first or second I think it was the second tape day. So it was still, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm it was brand new to all these people as well. And we had all sort of watched the original show where it, I mean, it's a trivia thing and, and to not go into a huge amount of detail, there's a part where you sort of establish what you're playing for. Every time you answer a question, you get a thousand bucks. You put a thousand bucks into the bank. And so, you know, part of thinking about getting on a game show is thinking about the money and thinking about what you could win, what you could not win. And, and you, you know, that whole thing. And I'm telling my wife, like, yeah, it's like, it's a thousand bucks for every right answer. Like, I think I might be okay. So we get there. And in our little briefing before the show, the producer tells us that we've been in discussion with Game Show Network about the prize money. It hasn't really been sorted out all together, you know, up until this point, but we can happily tell you that we'll be giving you five thousand dollars for every right answer. And it was the most exciting yeah. thing. It was yeah. so great. <laughs> it was so good. And I ended up not winning a damn thing, but it was it was still <laughs> fun. So it's, you know, sometimes fun. it can happen like the other way around where it's sort of exciting to Well, and that out. was kind of what happened they actually they kind of ripped it they told us it was like half a million dollars at first and i was like oh shit that's amazing right but then it became 250 with the with twenty thousand daily or like for each episode right and so that point we we're like oh so if we don't get the 250 we could still get the 20 right and like so the, it gave a lot of people a little bit of hope of like you know there there's other chances to make some money Sure, sure, sure. Oh, I mean, that would be that would be crappy TV to, you know, wait the entire season, the second last episode to get kicked out and you have nothing. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about when you played the game, because up until this point, it sounds like it sounds like a lot of standing around, almost like you're an extra on a movie set. And yep. there are certain <laughs> moments where you get to play the game. So let's talk about when you played. How how did that go? Well, um, that terrifying. Bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely terrifying. Um, I there is a lot of like chatter on the internet, and uh, you know, like, was it rigged? Uh, like, you know, all the gameplay happens on one side, you know, and there's an element I think where we're all like, I don't, I can't. I don't know how the randomizer work. I can't say it was rigged or wasn't, or, you know, I, I do think that like, it wouldn't make for great TV if there wasn't a, a, a level of like making sure that it was at least near a bigger chunk of the territory. Because if we just did like one, 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 and there was, no, you know, nobody, it wouldn't be entertaining. Right. Um, so there was a part, an element of me that was like, it's probably my turn. I'm so close to all of these big chunks of the floor. It's going to be my turn. And so like at that moment, I was like, it's it's me. It's me. I know it's me. Um, and it was me. <laughs> I was randomized. And, you know, in my head, I was like, say something funny. Say something Simpsons. So I totally did a Simpsons quote. I kind of butchered it because I was so nervous. 
Um, but my Simpsons quote was, um, you know, I can't even remember right now because I'm going to butcher it again. Um, I was like, look, Rob, I, 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 what I don't know can fill a warehouse, but I know the Simpsons, right? Um, okay. Oh, they made you do that thing where they, where they give you a line and you got to say it. Oh, boy. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to do a Simpsons line. And it's that part where like Bart's uh, eating over at the Reverend's house. Yeah, uh, right, right, right. Maybe. I've never, I've never heard, I've never heard more gratuitous use of the word "but." <laughs> but, 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 but. Make it stop. <laughs> um, and so I was like, I want to say something funny, and then, and then everything black. I, I legitimately blacked out. I feel like I blacked out. Like in my mind, <laughs> I, I had to like when I watched it, I was like, I don't even remember half those things happening. <laughs> um, my adrenaline was just. I, you know, I feel like my blood pressure, my adrenaline, everything was happened so quickly. Um, all I, it was a blur and it happened so quickly. You know, we have 45 seconds. So, you know, I got randomized. I had to pick someone and out of the categories around me, I felt the most confident with tourist locations, um, which was to the right. Cause I've, I've done a lot of traveling. Um, but at that moment, I didn't know Victoria, the person who had that category very well. I knew she was really smart, but I didn't know how smart she was. Uh, <laughs> sure. Looking back, I'm like, oh, I should have, I should have not done that. Um, but I picked her, and as I'm going up to the stage, that's when they're telling us the rules of the game, right? And the producers and the the makeup people are talking to me as I'm walking up, and I literally didn't hear a word they said. Like it was 100% a blur. Um, I go up there and every second feels like 20, 30 seconds. Like time was very strange. In my mind, I could remember saying, so if you've seen it, I like mess up um, two locations the most um, because in my head I was thinking locations and I was getting things like Niagara Falls and Buckingham Palace and uh, the Palace of Versailles. And I was doing fine with those, but then they switched to like artwork they did the statue of david and of course i know the statue of david it's on the simpsons <laughs> like you know right 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 um but my brain was like michelangelo was all i could get out and in my head and i thought that lasted 20 seconds like i was like i screwed up i said michelangelo like five ten times and that was 10 20 seconds of this game and then it happened again it was another art piece and it was the sistine chapel and again i was like I know this, but I like, I'm looking at the art and all I can think of is the artist and I'm saying Michelangelo again. Yeah. And you're again, just shook. <laughs> I'm just like, this is taking another 20 seconds. Um, but then re actually watching it, it all happens like within two seconds. And I'm like, Oh, I don't know why I thought that like dragged on forever. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so it was a very different feeling and like half those places I don't even recall saying, um, so it was, it was intense. Like I, I'm not proud of this because I'm a very stoic person. I, I like never cry, but the minute I stepped off that stage, I was just bawling and it wasn't because I lost, it was the adrenaline leaving my body. And so they're coming up to me um, and they're like, are you okay? Are you okay? Like, do you need to sit down? And I'm like, bawling. And I'm like, I'm totally fine. I'm just, I, like, yeah. Oh, it's just such a rush. It's everything just yeah. kind of comes to the surface. Yeah, absolutely. Though I understand that hundred percent. I've been in many situations where like, yeah, the feelings just sort of take over. And once it's over, it's just like that. It's like, it's like being a rubber band and being stretched all the way. And then finally somebody kind of lets it go, you know? Yeah. And it was, it was so visceral. Like I was like snotty and like, I could feel it in my body. Like this is like this heaviness lifting. And, you know, I, you know, in my mind, I was like, I wish I could have gone on, but, and another part of me was like so devastated that I didn't get to do the Simpsons. Right. Like I, I was like, if I had only done the Simpsons, if I, I could only show people like what a disappointment, like I would be so happy to go home if I like lost to the Simpsons because it was like somebody bested me and something that I was really good at, you know? Right. Um, but again, that idea that you you go through this whole process of selecting a sort of specialist subject and 
mentally preparing to be asked about that particular thing, because how could you not, you know, that's such a big part of this process. And then to go through the entire thing and not get asked a single Simpsons question, that doesn't seem right. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks so much. And it was, yeah. it was, it was truly devastating because I just I felt like, you know, if only um, granted, I don't know if you watched it, but there was a lot of um, there's a lot of say about how that the actual Simpsons category went down. And um, oh, I would don't even get me started. OK, listen, <laughs> here we go. So I was talking to my I, I have a. a a co-executive producer that handles all this podcast stuff with me. And I told him a few weeks ago that I was talking to you and that I was going to talk about uh, the Simpsons and you were appeared on the floor and that was your category. And, and he, his response through text was, Oh good. You can talk to her about how that category was bullshit. Yeah, it was bullshit. And yeah, and I felt this was a part again, like I hope this doesn't impact, you know, cut it if you think it will impact, um, my standing because I am open to to doing a show again and I, I I would be open to to a different show at, at the moment at the time I was like I never want to be on TV again <laughs> but sure um, but now that you've calmed down <laughs> well so I had finally the day before right the day before filming they finally told us our categories they had given us like a vague list of like a bunch of things and then the day the night before they finally gave us like what we were doing and so I found out I was the Simpsons super elated right i'm doing the simpsons visually i'm like it's gonna be simpsons characters i'm like great i even know the names of like you know uh, eleanor abernathy is cat, crazy cat lady i was like prepared for like if they gave me something like where you want the real name of these people or something sure, like sure, sure, al albertson is the comic book guy um and so i was prepared for like any simpsons character right? obscure characters right um but then when we were doing like hair and makeup, they had these pictures of us, uh, like a grid of of our photo shoot photos and like where we were on the floor, right? Like our locations on the floor. And underneath me, it didn't say The Simpsons. It said celebrities on The Simpsons. And Dang. I was very confused because I was like, am I The Simpsons or am I celebrities on The Simpsons? Those are two vastly different things, right? Even celebrities on The Simpsons could be strange. Like, is it, uh, you know, Sim like celebrities who played themselves like Paul McCartney or is it like Danny DeVito and I have to say um Herbert Powell right like do I right what, that can go so many different ways that even can go so many ways right and so I asked I asked I asked am I the Simpsons or celebrities on the Simpsons I asked a producer producer said you are the Simpsons and so I was like okay then this must be just like some weird mistake and I went on, we were all still a little confused. Like me and the contestants were like, let's just study for celebrities on The Simpsons just in case. But again, in my mind, I was like, they're going to do, surely they're going to just do like characters that have been on The Simpsons as their Simpsons character, right? Like I said, like Danny DeVito, Herbert Powell. And then I was like, okay, maybe it'll just be like, maybe that's too niche. Maybe they'll do like Sting as Sting, right? Or Bette Midler, right? Um Sure. But then to actually watch what it was, oh man, I I was still around. Like so, we filmed one or two episodes a day. Um, I left on the third morning of filming, so I made it to two day, whole days of filming. And on the third day of filming, I ended up leaving, and we're all staying in the same hotel. So I go back to the hotel, and everybody rushes to me, and they're like, "Sarah, do you know?" Because they know I love The Simpsons. Like I have Simpsons tattoos. I I love The Simpsons. Right. And they're like, you would be so disappointed. Guess what The Simpsons was. Um, and granted, they all had known that I had asked the producers if it was going to be Simpsons or celebrities on The Simpsons. And then they told me what it was. And I was like, oh, man, I would have probably walked off that stage, to be honest. Like, probably not because money's on the line. But, but... Yeah, sure. Yeah, but, it, <laughs> but, yeah, but preparing for, I mean, like preparing for, for, for one specific aspect of this thing and to get blindsided with a completely different I mean, how many how many stock photos of celebrities did you study in preparation for this thing? None, yeah. Nor like, did you think you would ever need to. Yeah, and I, I I really wouldn't have done well because like I you know I always call I you know even Louis I can't even say her name Juliet Louis Dreyfus I always call her Elaine I probably would have stood there being like Elaine <laughs> like you know um, right 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 I I can't yeah I don't. 
I'm really disappointed that that's the route they took. Like, I mean, there must be a reason for it. I, I you know, I can't say, I don't know. Um, because I, they own the Simpsons. They did other Simpson things. I think maybe they thought it would be more of an even playing field. I don't know how much more of an even playing field it would be for someone who never like listens to country music though, for instance, right? Like that's well, the whole true. It, it, right. That's just as narrow a, a, a facet of pop culture as the Simpsons is. And, and again, I keep going back to this idea that it, it, it's it's a Fox show. So how yeah. could you say it's too niche if 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 you're you're airing the damn? I, I don't know. That's a lot of more questions than answers being raised as a result of learning about. Oh, this for sure. Show. And I don't know if you've been on. Yeah, and if you've been on the Twitter, people are mad, right? Like there are a lot of Simpsons, and I felt so embarrassed. Like part of me wants, you know, set the record straight that like that's not what I walked into. That's not what I thought it was going to be. Nor would I like feel proud to do it like I I truly think I would have done well on a real Simpsons category and I had been like talking about it you know like guys what everybody that I know watch this I'm like in Simpsons groups and I'm like watch the Simpsons uh, like my the floor so that you can see me do the Simpsons and then I didn't do it <laughs> and then this also happened and I was like well I you know it is what it is but um it was really disappointing. It was really disappointing because I think that could have been so much better. Um, and I, you know, in a sense, like you're, I felt like I was, I was shafted in the sense of like, I didn't get to study the thing that I guess I was supposed to study. To be, to be fair, they did that with other categories, like the band category. I was like studying pictures of like actual bands and it turned out to be kind of like a, like a fun way of doing it. Um, right. You know, they did it with other categories for sure. So I wouldn't say it was just me or like inventors and inventions. Like they did it like fictional and non. Um, so I, I don't know if it's targeted, but I, right. I do. Sucks. Sometimes I wonder if that's not how shows save money. I remember this was back in 2000, 2012. They were doing a version of the hundred thousand dollar pyramid, and it's like a word communication thing where you're on a team with a celebrity, and you get a word, and you can, you you describe the word and get the other person to say the word. You could do whatever you want. You could act out. You could talk. Whatever. You just have to get them to say the word. And apparently, they got celebrities to play along with the contestants that didn't really know how to play the game. And in a situation like that, if your partner doesn't know how to play you don't win. And if you don't win, you don't win any money and you go home mm -hmm. with nothing. And so mm -hmm. eventually, um, I, I I wasn't there. I, I heard about this kind of secondhand, but all the contestants kind of went on strike. And they're like, mm -hmm. we are not going on set until you find us people who know how to play this game. Oh. And somehow, and sometimes I wonder like if that's not how they like save money on the budget. Because game shows have a budget like anything else, you know. And it, if you ever... um. If you're ever in doubt of it, if you watch The Price is Right and if you see somebody win something really big one day, mm -hmm. watch the show the next day and see how the games are like 15 times harder than they were the day before because oh, they need to like balance it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it's nothing like, it's, it's you know, to describe it, it, it sounds kind of scummy. It sounds like a weird sort of carny tactic. But at the end of the day, that's how they save money on the budget. That's how they... That's how they even out their books. So I wonder if it was. I I don't know. I don't know anyone connected with the show. It was so bad. Well, you know, and I, you know, we we again, we we also had lots of speculation. Is like, is it because of like Disney? But you know, Fox is, is part of Disney now, so who who knows? But we also thought like maybe it was just trying to be like not so niche so that anybody could win, right? Like keep it open for absolutely anybody on that board. But again, my argument would be that. Well, I don't know anything about country music. So like I would have been at, at the same disadvantage, right? Um, I also, you know, was it in response to, I mean, this whole game show in, in general probably was in response to the writer's strike, right? <laughs> like, you oh, know. for sure. Oh, for sure, um, for sure. So, you know, there's probably lots of aspects to it that, that went into the decision-making of it, right. but... Probably um, why it was all image related questions too, and nothing that had one hundred percent. And there was, we contested some of those images. You know, I, I there's this girl. Her name's Danny. Also lives in Austin, which is really great. A little bit up north, but I'm 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 from a I'm from South Texas. So I'm from a border of Mexico. You know, I'm I'm 
I know my huevos rancheros and they showed a picture of shakshuka for sure. <laughs> like, you mm. know what I mean? And so like there were things that even we contested it visually, right? Or I saw things about the bird category that like apparently they they shared like Irish pictures of this one bird. I don't know. I don't know anything about birds. But like you had to, there was an element of like, it's a bunch of people from Ireland thinking what Americans would like, you know? Right. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Um, Were your students proud of you after the whole thing, after you got home and you got to tell everybody to watch the show? Um, what was the reaction like uh, in your school? I felt really bad because I did say like, I'm doing this for my school. And I said the school name and they cut it out. Of course they did. Right. But of course, um, th- which also bugged me because we did like hours of interviews afterwards just for it to be like one line. <laughs> like I was like, what was the point of that? I listen, I that okay. <laughs> so that's a part of TV that has been ruined for me. Last year, this was in December of twenty two, I got an email from somebody producing a documentary for ABC. They were doing a four part documentary on the history of game shows. They asked me if I would like to be in it. And I said, Oh my God, absolutely. So they put me on a train to New York and I talked for about four hours total. Like they put me in a chair in front of a camera and they would just fire off names of shows. And at, at this point in my life, if you give me the name of a game show, I can talk about it. And so you don't need me to say anything about it anymore. I can just go and go and go until you say stop. So we did that for about <laughs> four hours. Like in, in the middle of the interview, they uh, somebody with the show came to me on camera and said, hey, if we get you a later train, can you stay longer? And I was like, yeah. And so apparently this is going great. It airs in May. It's four episodes. I am in it for maybe in total, like 45 seconds. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, what did you do with the rest of that shit? Like, I talked forever. It's so insane. And then, like, the way they they, they made us do it, too, is, like, they made it sound like it was going to be, like, a pop-up. Do you remember when MTV used to do, like, pop-up music videos where, like, Text oh would be yeah, a- pop of yeah, on VH1, pop a video. I remember that. Yeah, yeah VH1. Um, and so they were like, "Okay, talk to us like it's happening right now," because we're gonna put it on the screen. Like, talk to it like it's happening in the moment. And I and I did that. And I was like, "This is so silly." And then for it, none of it, none of it to go on stage. Um, but also, I was in a you know going back to the the kid thing. I you know I talked about my job, but they near it, but um, I had just gone through a job transition, actually. So I, I was very lucky because it was my first week at work and I had to ask for it off because um, I had been working at a different school district before I became an assistant principal at this 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 district. And right. luckily, my principal was so very nice. She was like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. This is crazy. Um, so really, no one knew, like, because they didn't know me. <laughs> so... I only only had the support of like my close family and friends. So, well, at the end of the day, that's all you need. Yeah. So, not really. My students didn't know. Now they know, right? And they they were like, "You were on TV, what?" Um, but at the time, you know, I filmed this in August, late July, August, August, and I was already yeah school school starting at a new school, so. I wish I wish they showed it, though. I really I was like, that was the one thing I was looking forward to. I was like, well, at least I got to do my shout out for my school. (laughs) Sure. And and at the end of the day, I mean, you know, whether the experience altogether was a some total kind of positive or negative, it sounds like mostly it was positive. There were things you would have changed about it, but it doesn't sound like something you wouldn't do again or wouldn't want to do again. I, like I said, I think in the moment and the days after, I like hated that experience. I was like, this was the worst. This was so taxing. And I think a part of that is like, we all got sick. We all got COVID. We all like, we, we. we oh, so there were, so there were parting gifts. Yeah, there were parting gifts. <laughs> we all called it the Lovid. Um, oh boy. The Lovid. So- <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think there's an element of like, I was tired and exhausted and cranky. Um, and now that like, I've had time to reflect, like, you know, it wasn't that bad of a experience. I'm like, I'll do that again. I would love to, like, you know, we we always joke that, like, man, they should bring some of us back to do, like, I want to, I want revenge, and I want to just do my real category. And I would even, you know, I'll take a handicap where um, everybody gets like the main characters, and I get like some random, 
you know, Hank Scorpios and, and maybe things that people don't know, Frank Grimes or, you know, I don't know. Sure. Well, and like you said earlier, there are only so many opportunities to participate in Simpsons trivia. Yeah. There are only so many Simpsons quizzes out there and opportunities to kind of flex that knowledge. And so to be denied that sucks, <laughs> you know? Well, it sucks. Yeah, I really, man. <sighs> I, I really want to, I want just, I just want to do the Simpsons. That's all I want. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, I am hopeful that there will be another opportunity for you to do the Simpsons at some point in the future. Um, they're already casting for the second season. I keep telling my brothers because they're avid Simpsons followers as well. And I keep telling them, like, you, you that should be your shtick, right? Like, you should go and say, I'm avenging my sisters because you wronged her, you know? <laughs> Right. <laughs> you gave her a bullshit Simpsons category. Well, in in closing, I wonder if we could summarize this experience. I mean, from going from somebody who's never participated in this kind of thing before to somebody who has flown to Ireland and appeared on this game show with 80 other people and just having that whole experience um, after the fact, after your home, after your healed up from COVID and after you see yourself on the show, um, what, what, what feelings come to mind when you think about the experience as a whole, the audition, the, you know, just the entire indoctrination into that world. How do you feel about it? Uh, you know, it was really eye opening in the sense where like what they don't tell you is the community that you, you build with the other contestants. I don't know if that's true of like, you know, some of these smaller ones, but all of us are in a, in a, in a group chat together and it's now created kind of a a shared experience for us that like we can live with and like also be able to to go and take it outside of that 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 experience where now we're visiting each other in their in our respective cities we're talking um you know every day or as much as we can and we're sharing other experiences you know there's two people um that are are now dating because of the show which is really really sweet um there's people who have now since have kids and i don't know it's just really neat to to more be in a community of people that had that shared experience with me and um i think that part's neat like this this is something we did together and we did it we were the first persons to do it right like there's a there's an aspect of the fact that like this is the first time they did this the show we're in the we're the first cohort of it and you know it could only get better and you know um i don't know it was it, it was a, an experience that like i definitely want to try again like i think it opened my eyes to this whole sphere of trivia game shows and game shows in general um that like could be really appealing right like something to do um outside of working, right? I always tell everybody I know, like, I'm going to work till I'm dead. That's, the, that's, the, that's how life is now, right? I'm, I'm 35. And like, it's so hard to, to pay for things anymore. And I'm just going to work till I die. And so if I can't find something fun to do and break up the monotony of life, like, then what's the point? And so I think that that's what this could potentially be for me, like something to do again. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Christian Carrion, for my studio in beautiful downtown Lancaster City, Pennsylvania. Co-executive producer, Corey Anatata. Researcher, Chuck Donegan. This has been a production of Buzzerblog, the most popular game show website in the world, in partnership with the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. For more information, visit museumofplay.org. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Christian Carrion. Good night. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. 
Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery, and how it illuminates cultural history. And their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by bonusround.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at BonusRound.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, the Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village an oasis of luxury.